Alrighty, this is section three, measurement of economic performance. Let's get started. All right, so first we have gross domestic product, or GDP, which is defined as the total value of all final goods and services produced in the economy during a given year. We've got three ways to calculate GDP. Value added approach, aka SIGIX, which is consumption plus gross investment plus government spending plus net exports, which is exports minus imports. Then we've got the expenditures approach, which we don't really deal with, so we're just going to ignore that one. And then we've got income approach, which is REWIP, or rent plus wages plus income plus profit, which are the four payments for our uh, factors of production, which are land, labor, entrepreneurship, and capital. When calculating GDP, we include certain things and we don't include certain things. So included in GDP are domestically produced final goods and services, including capital goods, new construction of structures, and changes to inventories. Not included in GDP is if, if, you. So we've got intermediate goods and services, financial assets like stocks or bonds, inputs, foreign produced goods and services, or used goods. Now there are two types of GDP, nominal and real. Nominal GDP is GDP at current prices calculated with current prices when the output is produced. On the other hand, real GDP is the total value of all final goods and services produced in the economy during a given year, calculated using the prices of a base year to remove the effects of price changes. So essentially, nominal is in current prices, and real accounts for inflation. Now let's talk about unemployment. Someone who's employed currently holds a job in the economy, whether that's full-time or half-time. Someone who's unemployed, on the other hand, is currently looking for work, but they're not currently employed. So to be clear, unemployed does not equal no job. Here are some basic equations we should know. The labor force equals the total sum of employed plus unemployed workers. The labor force participation rate is the labor force over the, the total adult population times 100. And then the unemployment rate, which is probably the most important, is the number of unemployed over the labor force times 100. The unemployment rate is typically a pretty good indicator of how hard it is to get a job in the economy, but it's not perfect. Here are some examples of when that would be, be the case. Discouraged workers are non-working people who are capable of working but have given up looking for a job due to the state of the job market. So, for example, that would be like someone during the Great Depression who is out looking for work every day and then eventually stops because it's kind of pointless. Marginally attached workers want to be employed and have looked for a job in the recent past but are not currently working, looking for work for reasons other than thinking there's no job available. So, for example, maybe they go back to school to get a graduate de degree or they suddenly become disabled, something like that. Underemployed workers are workers who would like to work more hours or who are overqualified for their jobs. So that would be if Miss Porteous, who has a bunch of degrees or whatever, goes and works at McDonald's. She's overqualified to work at McDonald's because she's gone to college. Okay, there's a couple different types of employment. We've got frictional, which is unemployment due to the time workers spend looking for a job. So it's, it's typical for a worker to quit a job and for it to take two to three weeks to find another. Structural is unemployment that results when workers lack the skills required for available jobs or when there's a surplus of labor supply. So maybe when people used to be phone operators, that was their job until we no longer needed phone operators and now they're structurally unemployed. Cyclical unemployment is the deviation of the actual rate of employment from the natural rate. We've got a couple equations. Uh, natural unemployment equals frictional unemployment plus structural unemployment, and actual unemployment equals natural plus cyclical. On to inflation. 
The inflation rate is the percent increase in overall level of prices per year. We write this as price level 2 minus price level 1 all over price level 1. If we were looking at the aggregate model, then inflation would be represented by an increase in price level. So, how do we measure inflation? Well, we've got price indices like CPI and GDP deflator. Consumer Price Index, aka CPI, measures changes in cost of a typical consumer's basket of goods. This is used to monitor changes in the cost of living over time. So, basically, economists choose a basket of goods that would be purchased by a typical consumer, and they fix it. So, over time, as prices inflate and the basket stays the same, they can measure how prices are changing. Inherently, this is also measuring inflation. Typically, CPI is going to be about 1% higher than GDP deflator because it overestimates inflation a tad. So there's three reasons why CPI actually overestimates inflation. The first being substitution bias. So as prices change, consumers alter the mix of goods and services produced. So, you know, if Coke raises prices, maybe I switch to an alternative good like Pepsi. The second would be quality changes, so products improve over time, so the quality increases, but um, price is inflating, so consumers are paying more but also receiving more. The third is introduction of new goods, so you know every year there's innovation, so new items emerge and the consumer choice is making money worth more. Now we've got GDP deflator, which measures changes in domestic production in the economy. So whereas with CPI, we're fixing the basket of goods and measuring the changing prices, with GDP deflator, where we're fixing the prices in terms of a base year and we're measuring the change in production over time. So in order to do that, we do 100 times the ratio of nominal GDP to real GDP in any given year. So again, prices are fixed, output changes, and then that change in quantity is used to determine inflation. Alrighty, that's it. That's everything you need to know for Section 3, Macroeconomics.